Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the Therapy Matters Podcast. This is your one-stop resource for expert insights and advice on everything therapy and rehab. I'm your host, Allison Jones, and today I'm joined by Simon Hargis, who is the owner and CEO of First Settlement Physical Therapy. Simon, thank you for joining me today. Hey, my pleasure. How's it going? Excellent. So glad to have you here today. So today we're going to discuss tips and tricks for running a successful therapy practice in rural America. There's a lot to unpack there. We're going to talk about operations, staffing, marketing, everything that's involved. But before we dive in, Simon, take a minute, introduce yourself to our audience and give them a brief background on yourself and your practice. Uh, sure. Um, so I'm um, a physical therapist and, and I also have my MBA. I I own and run my family's practice, which started about 25 years ago, and um, we're about a, as rural as it gets. So we're kind of southeast Ohio, the border of West Virginia. Um, it, actually, you know, that southeast Ohio portion is more rural in a lot of cases than the parts of West Virginia we're in. Um, we started about 25 years ago. My mom's also a, uh, a PT and um, uh, with one practice, and uh, we've gotten up to about 37 with about 200 employees. Uh, look, 37 locations with 200 employees, um, and that took about 20 years. Uh, the world's quickest origin story for the company is uh, uh, my mom was running a hospital um, physical therapy practice w within the hospital setting, and the administration came to her and said, "Hey, you know, maybe we grow this thing. Maybe we expand it outside of this this hospital building. Write a business plan." And, you know, my mother's not one for business plans. She's just PT all day. And uh, my dad is an engineer. He wrote the business plan. She presented it. And the hospital said, hey, that's way too aggressive. So um, classic, classic small business story after that. He quit his job. They took the second mortgage and and, and tried the, the business plan the hospital wouldn't take. And it, it, it took um, trials and tribulations. I feel like we've made, it has been diverse table conversation for me, since I was a kid, uh, you know, we've made most of the mistakes and trial by error and anything we go over is, is, is not um, genius. It's all just, um, hey, we, we probably tried all the other things and this is what we landed on. But that's that's kind of the idea, you know, very rural market. Um, mm -hmm. And and we've been able to grow um, and we've done that growth with with without backing, without debt. Uh, we're a debt free company and um, been able to have a really successful, you know, happy practice. All right. All right. Great. Well, so obviously, you know what you're talking about um, and uh, you're the right person to have here on uh, our podcast today. So let's dive right in. Um, you'll start out with the difficult question right off the bat. So is it possible to have a successful, is it possible to have a profitable therapy practice in rural America today? Yeah, I, it is. It is. It's okay. not, I, I don't know if any practice manager, which I, I think in my role, we, I, I tend to gravitate that more towards the, the CEO because Jack of all trades would say it's ever easy. And I think there's definitely uh, pitfalls to avoid and there's things you have to do to, to sustain it um, okay. well, um, especially now that we're in generation number two and, and we're more in growth mode in the last 10 years than we had originally. You know, our company was probably five to 10 clinics up until 2014. You know, when I really started uh, taking over and we got to that 37 just since then. So um, there's sustaining it, there's opening it, there's growing it. Um, all those things I think are completely possible, but I feel like, and we'll get to this, you're just solving a different set of problems sometimes that I think maybe you're, you're solving in a metropolitan area, you know, or, or more population dense area. Okay. Um, so, uh, so you approach those differently. Okay. So, Let's break that down then. So if somebody is coming and they want to um, open, they're starting sort of starting from the beginning and they're looking to open a, a practice. Um, what's your what's your advice? What's your tips for getting started? Uh, you know, a goofy one when you're when you're just staring at Google bats, maybe uh, that we stumbled upon because um, we did a lot of that. And it, and it was um, a couple of tenets we, we kind of live by is, you know, Avoid islands if you can have them. Now, if it's your first clinic, that's enough itself as an island. But right. you know, the cost of everything if it's not overlapping with something else you're doing is higher. So the staffing, the marketing. So especially in a rural market. But the other, the other thing that the, the short and 
or quick and dirty rule we always live by when we are analyzing a city and trying to find a new a new place was um, if it had no competition, a supermarket and a high school, uh, we were driving around that town. Uh, uh, now, now it's not always easy anymore to find a place with no competition, but fundamentally, you know, you look at the low hanging fruit first. And, and if we ran across a town within our footprint that wasn't, you know, too far out of our per footprint, making an island and it had a high school, had a supermarket and it didn't have any competition, it, it just lent itself it's like, oh, we need to check this place out. It's not a given that um, it works or that it's a place we go to because there's a lot of steps after that. But that in of itself would usually put us on the ground, looking at rent, looking at spaces, talking to local providers, seeing what that referral relationship and those habits are, how accessible um, is the local high school, what's the community like, how many smaller communities are feeding into this one, which is usually in, you know, a really big player. Um, you know, and then the big ask is like, can you find staff for this location, which is you know, the fundamental problem. Um, in a rural, uh, rural market. So uh, explain the supermarket piece of it. I think I might understand the supermarket connection, but explain that a little bit. What, what What's the tie-in with the supermarket? You know, some of it's intuitive after 25 years and we work backwards and just saw a pattern of successful satellites. It's like, oh, well, but you know, a lot of it is, if you're going it from the other direction and trying to look at a population number and then trying to look at maps of where these small towns are funneling into. Okay. Um, yeah. What you'll find is the results of most of the small things you're looking at end up being, oh, there's a high school here and a supermarket here because okay. the small th this is the funnel place, right? Um, and, and it has enough traffic and it has enough population to sustain those things. Um, so it, it ends up being a, like just an easier way of searching. So, you know, I might, when I'm looking at a particular particular place on the map, I might start at the point of just let me look at the high schools, right? And then and then I'll overlay, let me look at competition. And then I'll overlay what kind of supermarkets are there. And then when you look at that street, you know, um, and, and it's funny in a rural market, the other thing, we have a really successful, you know, and it's talking numbers. That's all for us, a successful satellite clinic's like 100 visits a week, right? Mm -hmm. And that might be crazy small to some folks, but yeah. to us, that's that's a successful satellite clinic. And I have clinics where there's literally a traffic light, a high school, a supermarket. Now nowadays, probably a Dollar General, maybe a Subway. And you're and and you're looking at it, it's like, and that's it. And he's like, there's no way a clinic's going to work here. And you know, and maybe maybe a library or something. Um, and it does if there's enough small towns, and that's the funnel place, and that's really the only option. We'll have clinics that are. It's the only outpatient clinic in the whole county, right? And and yep. um, that's that's how rural we're talking about. But it works if if uh, you can find the staff and you can find the right location. And and some of those other factors are uh, are um, are playing. And there's some real advantages, and we'll talk about that. So it's like, hey, I just said no competition. There's 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 advantages there. You know, these places are are cheap to be in. You just you just have to be smart about where you're placing it. Okay, so. Well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about some of those advantages. What sure, are the sure. advantages? Yeah, right. It's it's so easy to go over disadvantages yeah. in, in a in a in a rural marketplace. Right. right? Everybody's going to say, "Well, your pay mix is bad," and and it's hard to find staff. And it is. Right. And and I think unlocking the key to all of this has is a, is a long form conversation about staffing. Yeah. But I think some of the advantages to just get people interested or thinking about rural market is is you know, hey, uh, there's a there's there's often no competition or a low level sophistication of competition. Um, a lot of times, I think in more metropolitan areas, you're you're always dealing with very insular, vertically integrated hospitals and health systems, right? But the closest health system to a lot of these places is, you know, an hour and a half to a three hour drive. So so all of a sudden, you know, they're they're not saying telling these patients, hey. You have to drive that distance three times a week for your physical therapy for these specialty. You know, somebody had a surgery or, you know, a stroke or something. Um, that's 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 not the case. So so it's an easier conversation to be like, hey, here here's our option. An easier conversation even to have with a vertically integrated health system that's a drive away saying, oh, you know, we're not competition, so we, we can talk, right? right. Um, um, that makes it easier. Um, uh, I, th I think another big thing that makes it easier is just the cost of space. 
Um, most most folks, when when I and I've never had a practice, you know, West Virginia, the whole state's like a million and a half people. Like our our yeah. entire state's not the population of a real size city, um, you know. Uh, but uh, you know, I've heard some of their rents. You know, my rent in a lot of these places, uh, my lowest rent is eight dollars a square foot. Now, not everybody's there, right? But it ranges from you know eight to. Fourteen dollars a square foot is is the typical range. Which, if people don't think of in terms of square foot, think in terms of you know I can have a a three thousand square foot clinic, which is actually a lot bigger than what a lot of metropolitan areas would have. Yes. But you, to me, that's medium. You know, we we range from twenty five hundred to eight thousand square feet, right? But a three thousand square foot clinic in a rural market might be twenty five hundred a month. You know, that's cheap to yeah. be there. You can. There's a lot of variety you can have there. Um, there's there's a lot of programs you can run in a space that big, and then mm -hmm. um, it can be a bit of a um, a center for that town, um, and in a lot of different ways. So, so there, there's definitely advantages, I think. So let's switch to you know a disadvantage or a challenge. And we won't say it's it's not a disadvantage, but it's a challenge. Staffing. Staffing. And, and oh I mean, staffing, staffing is a challenge across the board, you know, whether whether you're in a, mm -hmm. a metropolitan area, whether you're in rural, you know, it's it's a challenge everywhere right right, right now. Um, so how do you deal with the staffing challenge and staffing shortages and um, how do you staff up um, all of your clinics and make sure that um, you're able to address all the needs of your patients? You know, I think at least with our story, it started with it. And one of the pros and cons to staffing too is, is when you get somebody that wants to live here, it's usually because they have roots here. They wanted to move back here. Not always, not always. But so on, on, on the one hand, it's harder to find people that want to live in the places you're in, in the rural area, but your turnover rates also just wildly low um, uh, if you're doing things right. But you know, for us, especially if you looked at our company, you know, I said, it's like, okay, we had 10-ish clinics in 2014 and we got to 37. And, and and the fundamental driver behind that was solving that staffing part a little bit. And I think, I think one of the key changes for us is we had so much experience courting and developing referral relationships. I think every PT does to some extent, you know, there's direct access here. That's not to say there isn't, but, and, and that, long form relationship and conversation and touch points. What we started really doing is any school, PTA or PT school that was within a three hour drive, spending a lot of time treating that program like physical therapists had been treating the doc doctor relationship. High touch points, stopping by, what can we do for you? How can we partner? Mm -hmm. How can we take our internships to the next level? Um, a big part of it for me and taking over the practice was we didn't really have a culture of every clinician is expected to not just take, but enjoy and make it part of the practice having students and not just the students um, in, in the schools. You have to start, this is hard enough in a rural marketplace where we're starting to take observational hours um, all the way back in high school. And some of those kids now, wow. and that's because we've been in practice long enough, um, are the people we end up hiring, right? That might seem a daunting task, but it's that hard to staff here, right? Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's that long form conversation, but we also take it super seriously. We don't miss an observational hour opportunity from any level. We don't, all our clinicians are required after two years experience to be taking students. Uh, we incentivize students. You know, there's, there's even a trend right now to, well, students are a burden. We're gonna charge them to be here. Um, any final year rotation student we offer uh, a five hundred dollars stipend, and we even have a few clinicians that have remodeled their basement, um, including my mom. Um, so I'll have people living in my parents' basement with free housing. So if you're offering a five hundred dollars stipend and free housing, that might sound like overkill, but that's how important of a problem it is to solve. Yes. And and when once you get that exposure, you'll get even the folks that weren't moving back here just for family. You'll get the folks that really had no destination. And there's a lot of anxiety with new grads graduating. What am I going to do? How, you know, am I going to get thrown in? They're, they tend to lean towards anybody they have a previous relationship with just as a solution to that anxiety, right? So, yeah. so it was just, it was really, really treating university programs 
and student relationships like we were already treating doctor relationships, developing them, going after them, being very aggressive about going after them. Yeah. I mean, you're creating a loyalty program. Yeah. With. Yeah. With. Hundred providers. I mean, <laughs> yeah. instead of doing it with your patients, you're doing it with your future providers. Yeah, and a straightforward example. So we, the, you know, the apartment we use that's that's just free housing. Um, right now, in the industry, and this is, I guess, lecture a lot of PT schools. And it's really interesting because I I poll them four or five schools, and the percentage of those kids that want to do travel is really high. It used mm-hmm. to be you'd have a few per class. And now, like some of these classes have twenty percent of the kids that want to go right out of school and travel, and that's unusual because travel companies that used to use folks with that low experience level, and they weren't that interested because they didn't have any experience in the nature of travels to get thrown in. Right. Um, but because of all sorts of factors, debt, and whatever. But just just going back to forming those relationships, we had them for rotations. I had two kids that um, wanted to do travel and said, "Hey, instead, do travel for us for a year and take advantage." for the first three or four months, six months of some free housing, um, which is which is going to counteract that, that housing stipend, some of these these travel folks, and do it internally. Yep. Um, and they they immediately jumped on it um, be, because they're already familiar with us. And we had we had talked to them going back six or seven years. Um, so, um, so yeah, it, it's really treating those relationships as much as you would treat, you know, going after patients or going after um, docs. Um, to solve that staffing equation, you have to be... Um, um, I, I think aggressive makes it sound mean, but but you know wildly um, you got to take the initiative and in every chance meet the professors, meet the students, guest lecture. Yeah. Every every school in the country would love somebody from your class to come and give a free lecture on some random topic. If you're not doing that, you're not forming those relationships because because then you're seen as an expert. So when I say a lecture, some you know I do the ethics class for free, I do the business classes for free, I mm-hmm. you know, do a lot of the the um, the, the mock interviews so the kids are getting used to in that final year you're literally doing a mock interview with the student graduating and you hear like this is where they want to live and it's in your footprints like hey hey after this you want to have a real interview you know and come and, talk to me <laughs> yeah right and and so so every one of those um opportunities i i feel like to be successful on the grow side or even starting it on on the staffing side in a rural market if you're not taking advantage of those, it's actually pretty hard to sustain over time because, you know, if you do lose staff, it's really difficult. Wow. I mean, that, that was, that was a lot in there. (laughs) (laughs) That was amazing. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, so a couple other things. So one thing that I really want to talk about, because it's near and dear to my heart being in marketing, got to talk about marketing and sort of how you uh, create that patient connection. So we just talked about how you're creating connections with, you know, future staff and and how you create that sort of loyalty there. How are you creating the connection with uh, the patients in your community or um, when you're going into new communities and um, spinning up uh, new practices? How are you getting the word out? What are you using for your marketing mediums? Uh, what have you seen has been most successful for you? How do you create that ongoing um, connection with them? Give me some insight well, I'll start, there. I'll start with some contrast because I think I think there's some there's some some overlapping areas. I assume, right? And, and you know, yeah. hey, are we all doing some targeted Facebook ads? Yeah, because yeah. I think it's a cheap and easy way to do it. But yeah. um, and Facebook's still probably really maybe a little more powerful here in the rural marketplace than than it is in other places. Mm -hmm. But I think some bigger differences and some advantages are, I think there's types of marketing you'll find here where uh, it's just not cost effective uh, for a whole bunch of reasons to do it. And as you know, TV is a real option here. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. It's it's cheap, you get a lot of eyeballs. It's where people get their high school sports, you know, radios and other really good, especially with high school sports, you get a lot of ears Um, and and it's not cost prohibitive. Um, which is which is strange because you, you know same thing with billboards which you know I think have a terrible ROI and then a whole lot of fields but the right billboard in a rural marketplace when it's the only billboard in town is is something folks talk about and there's even more weird stories and and I have them for like half of our clinics of the weird in a rural marketplace marketing ideas that you'll come across. I, I give you a couple of my favorites. Um, so one new clinic we just opened up in the last year, uh, the town, and I was talking to the 
the town and the mayor and and they had this this odd idea and they're like would you even try this it's like i love it i'll i'll do it for six months and they just want to do it where so their main street had meters and they were going to do a, a business sponsorship meter where it's like hey what if we put these these bags over it mm-hmm. and it looks pretty like you know it's bubble gum and, and shoestring but literally just a plastic bag over it you put a color print out and say, hey, this meter is is paid for by this business, and yeah. and they do the whole street. And they're thinking a week. I'm like, and they told me the price, and it was like fifty bucks or something. Yeah, that's like, hey, how about I give you a thousand bucks and we do like six months? <laughs> um, and they're like, you wouldn't do that. It's like hundred percent. I'm gonna, you know, basically the whole town's meters are gonna be paid for almost nothing. Every meter has our flyer on it. Yeah, are, are you kidding? This is. This is a no-brainer. You'll run across these really weird um, ideas that ends up over a period of time hitting everybody in town because of right. the centralized location. Here's another really goofy one. We were, we were, and this is one of our oldest clinics. We were starting this clinic, and they still had a movie theater, which in a lot of the towns we're in, we're in the Rust Belt. Um, these movie theaters are you know, often closed buildings. But this one still had one. It was really interesting. It's owned by the county. It had one, one screen. It made... Um, it's money off the the concessions, um, and uh, and we went in and nobody had d- done this before. And and every Friday night, the movie was sponsored by our clinic. Everybody in town could go there for free, and it was the first time they had had to line out the door in a decade, right? And 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 so that was working. Where it's like this is working well, but I think we could take it to a next level. So what we ended up doing is, and we did this. We ended up doing this for like a year. You had to come to our clinic to pick up your free ticket. Ah, so yes, and 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 this was like, and you're like, oh my gosh, how expensive! It was like three hundred bucks to buy the entire town's movie t- night, yeah. you know, sponsorship. A good investment uh, every, every Friday night. So over the course of the year, some crazy percentage of everybody in the town had actually walked through our clinic to get their free movie ticket. So you'll find these these really nutty marketing opportunities that I just don't think are easily uh, uh, available when you're just talking about this huge, giant, crazy place with, you know, where everything's expensive and there's just so many people happening. The, 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 the touch points you can get in a small market end up being really interesting for really low cost if you're out there talking to folks, you know, talking to the pharmacies, um, being in the senior center. You know, if you just do once a month bingo at a senior center and do their turkey dinner, um, and, and that county ends up having a really vibrant senior center, you have a huge percentage of your demographic that's, that's insanely loyal to you. And, and all for, for, you know, I mean, all the ROI on that is off the charts, right? right? Uh, um, you just, you, and, and once you get those playbooks, it's not hard to, to run them again. Right. Because easily, the, the core, easily, the easily core replicable. components of these yeah. places, a lot of these places are, is the city center of a county where, okay, the courthouse is here and the city, the senior center's here um, because there's not a whole lot else in the county. Um, so it's not hard to, it's like, okay, which one of these ideas is going to work in this town? You know, and then you bring in the high schools, but a lot of us are already in the high schools doing stuff. So this is, I think I, I'm trying to give examples that are a little bit more out of the box that are you know, attuned to a rural market, which I just, I just don't think you'd see some of that stuff maybe in a a big city. I don't know. I'm not into a big city that much. (laughs) Yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're right. I think you're right. I just, I don't think those types of opportunities would, would present themselves because I think a lot of what you're talking about really is based around, um, creating connections, um, Mm -hmm. with, with your community. And I think that's a little bit harder when you get into a bigger city, it's harder um, to have more of those personalized um, connections, um, just be, just but, based on size, I, it's just harder. And to I'll do put that. it under the marketing category when you talk about connections. I think that's also one of the risks when I was thinking about this topic or downsides is we all worry about reputation management. But yes. when your pool of referral sources, community resources, all these things is so small you don't get many strikes, right? So I think in your admin policies where I've seen people be unsuccessful um, um, and you have to rethink some things, you might take a class at PPS or something and they're like, hey, you have to be crazy hardcore about co-pays or you're just gonna have a failing practice. Or, you know, uh, I'll give you another example. Somebody runs over auth and you're just like, nope, that's it. You gotta get more auth through your insurance company. It's like, oh, okay, no. We're going to go so many visits past that, and if we don't end up getting that off, that charge doesn't go to you. We're just going to eat it. Or if our 
IV person, which we do that. We explain their benefits and we call their insurance for them. And, and it's like, if something we said, because you can call an insurance company and get a different answer every day, right. something we said was wrong and you didn't understand it, we're going to eat that cost because that reputation management with, you might be in a town where there's literally three primary care docs. Yeah. Like that's, that's, that's it, right? And so you can't really ruin that relationship off of a hardcore financial policy that's not really seeing the forest from the trees. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just, you know, your, your volume's lower. And I think from an operations standpoint too, we err on the side of relationships. So we err on the side of a longer visit, which, you know, w was commonplace 15 years ago. Yep. Um, where the economics of, you know, I think if you were in a clinic where you had more visits than you had people or and getting visits was a problem a 30 minute visit a 45 minute visit makes a lot of sense it decreases your risk with cancellations the math always works itself in a rural market where you're it's all relationships and your goal is if you hit it out of the park with this person you're going to see their entire family which i know is what we say in any clinic but it is literally what happens here you lose or get that whole family um so you err on the side of longer visits you err on the side of eating some of that cost um, that that's not as sharp pencil as my dad would say with, on, on the admin side. Um, but to me, that's, that, that falls in the category of marketing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to go back to what you were talking about, um, real quick. So when you had talked about going from 10 to 37 clinics, right? Um, that's a big jump. Uh, what, what were three things that you did to make that happen? Sure, sure. Um, I think the first, the first goes back to, uh, it was like flipping a switch. Mm -hmm. um, I required the staff to start having students. And I didn't know how much of a switch that was. I mean, if you go to one thing, it was, okay, only the staff that wanted to, and even they complained about it too. No, guys, we're going we're to we're do this and we're going to like it. Yeah. And once we started doing that, we started getting the resumes. We started getting the relationships. I, I think that was the biggest, that was that was as, as much as anything, the faucet. And then we started learning how to develop those relationships. I think we went backwards and looked at the commonalities of the clinics we had that were successful. And we got really good at being able to drive through a small town and, and, and easily say, hey, we need to take this really seriously or not. I think the other thing we got really good at, and this took... It's kind of like you learn all those lessons in the first first half or two thirds of the practice, and then you package them up and start implementing them. We really, and, and my, especially me, I really went by this um, this idea that you could staff a network of clinics with less people than it would take if each of them were an island. So, so we have a fundamental core staff in every clinic because consistency is important, relationships are important. Yeah. But we also, and, and this is part of our culture and part of the folks, especially the new grads, they come in and they know, hey, you got to float a little and you're going to earn your home base. We have networks of clinics and networks of staffs where there's a percentage that flow and breeds with the natural ebb and flow of visits and evals in any clinic. And what you'll notice in any clinic is it's seasonal, it's referral-based, it's there's 10 different reasons. You know, this doc likes to take his vacation here. Yep. Um, hey, there was a frost the other day, and in six weeks, everybody's getting their casts off for the proximal humeral fractures and distal radial fractures, right? There's an ebb and flow to clinics on, you know, you're understaffed and you're overstaffed. You're understaffed and you're overstaffed. Um, what we started trying really hard to do is have networks of clinics, and this is very decentralized, of small clinics in groups where we could breathe with that ebb and flow with, with some percentage of, of full-time people, but that are traveling in between those clinics, who's busy and who needs the help. And if you looked at it from afar, you were now running adequately with proper staff and hitting your metrics in those networks. But if they were all by themselves, you would have to have X number more staff than you're actually using. And so that efficiency and a lot of that growth gets to how can you get really efficient when 40% of your payer mix is Medicare, you know, 10% of 10 to 12, 10 to 15% of your payer mix is Medicaid. You know, if you're lucky, you're getting 10% comp, maybe 15% if, if you're, if you really have a plan or something by you and the rest is commercial. And even some of the commercials in Southeast Ohio, 
um, are paying less than the Medicaid and their capitated visits. So there's a lot of efficiencies you have to get good at, and that's just a few of them. But I think that the biggest efficiency we learned is, is, is how to run in those networks of clinics and networks of staff and, and staff them adequately, but with less staff than if, if they were all by themselves. But I think the other thing we, we err on the side of and we really ran with is a decentralized model. And in, in a rural marketplace, you're going to come across this, this large vertically integrated health system that everybody's driving to within a three hour radius. And if you can be as efficient in the suburban and rural areas around there um, and have these little network of clinics where patients can drive 20 minutes instead of 45 minutes to get to their PT, it's a no brainer for them, right? And, and that's the other fundamental thing that really took off the practice where we started picking on hospitals where in the surrounding areas, there was an outpatient competition. It was too centralized in my opinion uh, for, for something that's as high touch as physical therapy. So we did a lot of decentralized small clinics in these tiny towns around it yeah. um, um, and ate their lunch, <laughs> there <you go. laughs> right? <laughs> so. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, we're getting close on time here. So one final question. So if yeah. there was one final bit of advice that you would give somebody about um, helping them grow or helping their practice thrive, rural or not, uh, what would it be? You know, a final piece of advice, I think the first parts, the mistakes I've seen go back to where we're undervaluing what a, what a student can bring both after they graduate and before. Um, and, and what a strong relationship with their university can bring. I think in general, even with the 15% cut that just happened, I think we're undervaluing what a long-term well-trained PTA can do. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't run super high, you know, we're not one to five or something. We're, we're, if you do the average, we're probably one PT to one and a half PTAs. Um, and I've had, a, I've heard a lot of discussion about PTAs and the 15% cut. I, I think to make this work here, um, um, is, is to not give up on that that relationship and, and get everything out of it you can and, and take the training seriously, um, I, I think would be the, the second big advice and thing. I, 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 discussion I see where, where I think I have a pretty strong opinion of it, um, as, especially going back to the school thing and people trying to charge students to come here. If, you're, if that's your mindset, you're doing it wrong. It, you're just looking at it wrong. You're not, you're not getting what you, you, you can get out of that relationship. Um, and, you know, I think the other big thing that we were slow to come across is, um, and, and my other favorite thing to say about rural markets, and, and I'm guilty of this as well, hey, we still have a couple towns with video stores. We're, we're 10 years <laughs> behind on some trends. But this idea of, and uh, uh, everybody in the industry has been saying direct access, but if you go past that and just talk about marketing, how to outreach digitally with some sort of communication, ad, whatever it is, and then have an automated funnel that goes from, okay, an automated communication, they're serious enough, that turns into a real person communication. Um, uh, you have to be doing that. Even in a rural marketplace, you have to be doing that. Yeah. Um, and you have to be getting good at it. You can't be uh, anymore like, oh, we're gonna start this. It's like the, the, the game's leaving that a little bit. And um, you have to find an EMR that does it, or you have to find other some internal way to do it. I think internally is way too hard if you want to have that level of sophistication with the automation and right. the beginning parts of the funnel. But if you're not if you're not actively proactively reaching out to former patients, but even which I see a lot of places doing, but reaching out to folks in different ways that you've never had a conversation with and getting them into some sort of funnel, um, um, that, that that you're you're getting behind. Yeah. I mean, it's just an expectation nowadays, right? That's just how we, that's how we communicate with everybody that we interact with. Um, it's just, and, and it's that, just and how it's, it's changed. Not, and, and, and it's not, and maybe and 10 years ago in a rural market, I would have never used it either. I didn't, wouldn't have known what, what that even meant. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's even here and it's, it's not just here. It's, it's, it's um, absolutely required. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, that is uh, great advice. Thank you so much, Simon. That was uh, that was a wonderful talk. I think. Oh, I th thanks. This is awesome. No, yeah, pleasure. Yeah. I'm glad you guys are doing this. I think um, 
I think that a lot of, a lot of takeaways and I, you know, I think not just, I, I think this applies across the board. I think there's a, a couple themes in here that, um, you know, everybody should pay attention to relationships is what I heard a lot of, uh, you know, through what you were discussing today. Relationships are so important. Relationships with uh, building your staff, relationships with your patients. Um, that's such a key piece to having a successful business. Thinking outside of the box. Um, so, you know, when you're talking about um, your different uh, marketing approaches, you know, you have to figure out what works in your market. So it might be putting the bags on the meters and paying for that for six months. Or it might be a really big digital billboard in a um, in a city square. So, you know, you have to you have to figure out what is going to work for for your business and your space and your budget, obviously. Um, but you know, don't limit yourself to what you think is the norm, right? So, so try to be innovative. Try to think outside the box. So, I think there's a lot of great takeaways uh, here. Uh, for folks to to grab onto. So I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much for for being with us. And, um, you know, as always, we hope that uh, our listeners uh, take away a few nuggets that uh, they can um, internalize and, and take into their uh, practices. And um, uh, thank you for listening to Therapy Matters Podcast, your one-stop resource for expert insights and advice on everything therapy and rehab. We hope to see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to Therapy Matters. Do you like the podcast? Give us a five-star rating, subscribe, and tell all your friends about the show. Want to be a guest or know someone that would be a great guest speaker? Contact me at allison.jones at raintreeinc.com. That's A-L-L-I-S-O-N dot jones at raintreeinc.com. Therapy Matters is brought to you by Raintree, therapy and rehab's favorite EMR. Raintree is the only all-in-one therapy EMR delivering a complete and seamless end-to-end patient journey from first contact to payment to patient retention. To learn more about Raintree, visit us online at raintreeinc.com.